So uh, my presentation will be about how we can use um, can you see me? <laughs> okay <laughs> how we can use um, time reversal cavity to focus high intensity ultrasound pulses over a large 3D volume. <coughs> but why would we want to do so? So for example, for um, several ultrasound therapy techniques such as histotripsy or lithotripsy, we need to focus um, very locally um, high negative uh, peak pressure to reach the cavitation threshold. But we also need to be able to uh, steer the beam in three dimensions in order to treat large regions. Nowadays, carbon solutions include uh, the use of focused mono-element reducers that will allow you to reach easily high negative pressures, but will only uh, allow, allow uh, mechanical steering and no uh, tracking of a moving target. You can also use a two-dimensional array of very high power transducers that will give you, to some extent, three-dimensional steering um, with an electronic uh, solution. However, you will need a very high amount of element and a very uh, complex uh, device. Um, so our lab is developing a third kind of solution, that is time reversal cavity, that will allow us to both reach high negative pressures very locally and also treat very large region with only electronic steering while keeping the number of elements to a minimum. But what are uh, time reversal cavities? So it's basically a reverberating cavity in which we perform time reversal focusing. And that means that for, um, for, oops, for a given target here, we start by emitting a very short uh, pulse that will then propagate through the cavity here, reverberating on the walls, and forming these long codas that are then picked up on the array on the other side of the cavity. These codas are then time reversed and re-emitted from the array through the cavity. And because of, uh, or thanks to, um, the time reversal um, uh, invariance and the spatial reciprocity of uh, wave equations, the signals will then refocus automatically on the initial source point. So the cavity should be a bounded medium with a low uh, transmission in order to uh, spread temporarily uh, the signals because the longer the coda will be, the more energy we will be able to emit. And thanks to the temporal compression of the signals at the source point, we will be able to reach higher amplitudes there. However, it should also be quite leaky, otherwise the coda will have such a low amplitude that we will not be able to hear them on the array. So this design of an efficient uh, cavity will be a trade-off between these two elements. So to achieve that, we started with um, a very open cavity of just reverberating walls filled with water, in which we placed uh, here a linear array of transducers, but with a high elevational width, that is to be able to emit um, high enough uh, power. Oh, well. uh, so you can see the code that we obtained here that is basically, well, you can just see a few well-defined reflections there and nothing in between, so the energy will be just concentrated on these four sources. But now, if you place in this cavity multiple stretching medium, that is a rod for us, uh, you'll be able to fill all the gaps in the coda and thus emit much more energy over the same period of time. So this particular cavity gives us a two-dimensional beam steering in a horizontal plane, the perpendicular to the rod for us. And we were able to reach high enough negative pressures uh, to reach the cavitation threshold in water. However, so this was very good, but we only had two uh, degrees of freedom. And I'll try to show you how we can adapt this, uh, this device and transform it in order uh, to gain the third degree of freedom, say the vertical one. So I'll, tr uh, I'll start by showing you a few uh, simulation results that gave us insight of how we could do so, and then move on to some experimental work. So for our simulations, we used the SimSonic software, and we uh, defined a medium here uh, that corresponded to uh, our two-dimensional setup. So what you see here is the forward phase, where we emit a pulse from outside the cavity and pick the signals up here on the array inside. And then we re-emit the signals, 
be red. Okay, we remove the signal from inside the cavity and look at the spatial topo um, focusing here on the um, initial source. So from there, we then modified slightly um, and progressively our region in order to gain the third degree of freedom. So quite intuitively, we decided that we should make uh, both the diffusive medium and the transducer elements isotropic to have a more symmetric uh, uh, setup. And we replaced the rods inside the cavity by small beads, so metal beads inside water. And we also um, changed the shape of the elements. So instead of um, elements with a high elevation and a really uh, thin width, we used squared elements that kept the same, uh, the same total active area per element to be able to use the same power. And this was quite, uh, well, we had quite nice results with that. You can see here, so this is at the center where the little star is. Um, we have quite similar results, but even better, and with a 16% gain in pressure. And this is due to the fact that we no longer only focus uh, the beam um, in the horizontal direction, but also vertically. So we have a, an isotropic focusing, and we are able to reach higher pressure. And this is even more spectacular if we place ourselves in the corner here. So not only um, on the side here, but also at the top of the cavity, so really uh, out of the plane that you can see on the screen, um, where we previously had, with a two-dimensional setup, a 25% loss in pressure. And we, uh, and we now only have a 13% loss with a really ni uh, nicely focused uh, signal and a good signal. So we were quite happy with that, but we thought we could improve these results further by um, tending to even more isotropic uh, elements. So that is by tending to a point-like source um, transducer element. So what we did is we reduced the size of the, size of the elements step by step. And you can see here that, well, um, the bigger the element is, uh, the lower the pressure will be at the focal spot. And this is due to the information loss you have due to um, the directivity of the uh, bigger elements. Um, yeah. So with that, we thought we had um, well enough information to try and move on to uh, experiments. However, we encountered a few uh, limitations. Well, they were practical ones. So first of all, I said we'd like to have smaller elements. But it means that you will have more heating if you want to emit the same power, and you can break your elements. So that was a problem. And also, um, well, so to perform time reversal focusing, you need to have an absolutely fixed medium. And we actually were not able to, um, to design um, a sort of suspension of small beads in water, but in a completely frozen way. They would be moving around. So uh, despite the results, we, we decided to, uh, instead of basing ourselves on the simulation results, just go back to our two-dimensional setup and then incrementally modify, modify it sorry, in order to try and have uh, our third degree of freedom. So just as a reminder, this was our last uh, two-dimensional setup. These two um, transducer, power transducers of elements with high elevational width and small um, lateral width. And I watch for us here. So as we couldn't use beads, we, we decided to add a second uh, rod fret or orthogonal to the first one in order to scatter the beam not only uh, horizontally but also vertically. We also decided to rotate uh, one of the transducers to have a bit more symmetry um, in vertical and horizontal direction. So this was, uh, so this was our first um, three-dimensional time of visual cavity prototype. And to assess its performances, uh, we placed oops, we placed a hydrophone here in a plane 10 centimeters away uh, from the cavity and moved it around um, a large area, performing time reversal focusing in each of these positions. So all the spots corresponding to a particular uh, focal spot, right? And we then looked at the pressure uh, we obtained there. So we observed that we could move it around uh, an 8 by 8 centimeter area without uh, losing too much pressure. And moreover, um, the, the quality of the focus was quite good. So you can see here at the maximum pressure at the center of the cavity, we have a thin and isotropic focal spot. 
But this is still true if we move further away from the center. Um, so that was nice, but it was still not as good as what we had in simulations. And uh, as we couldn't actually uh, change our hardware, uh, but the transducer uh, were not so much adapted to a 3D uh, cavity, we tried to modify them by just placing a PDA mass uh, converging acoustic lens directly on the transducer to try and make it a bit, bit more isotropic. <coughs> and this was actually quite efficient. As you can see here, by placing um, an acoustic lens on the transducer, we improve the steering capability of our device in both directions, so vertical and horizontal. However, uh, mostly because the PDMS is an absorbing medium, we had um, a global drop in the pressure we had at the focal point. Um, so we then tried uh, to optimize our diffusive medium to try and reach even higher pressures. And indeed, by looking at the codas, uh, we noticed that they, ha they had um, a very low amplitude and that they were very long, uh, meaning that maybe the transmission of our cavity was too low. So we decided to reduce the thickness of our medium in order to have shorter codas of higher amplitude. And indeed, uh, it allowed us to reach uh, to, to double the pressure we had at the focal spot. This setup still gave us uh, quite good um, steering capability, so a six by eight centimeter area, and um, we were able to reach uh, very high ne uh, negative and positive pressure. So a measurement on the interferometer gave us plus 36 and minus uh, 10 megapascal which is just below uh, the cavitation threshold. So it gave us confidence to try and move on to a histotripsy application on a very simple target. So that was a slice of ham that we placed in front of uh, our device here in the gas water. And we then fired at full power at a 100 uh, hertz QRF. And you can see the target before and after the treatment with a very clear and neat um, lesion here. We were also able um, to observe our cavitation double cloud by keeping the very same um, setup but changing the target for a uh, water balloon. <coughs> so we defined uh, four different um, four dif different targets at the corners of a small square. Oops. Oh yes, that's all. <laughs> and then we targeted them either separately or simultaneously. And you can see um, clearly a bubble cloud here uh, in one position, but if we now target two different positions at the same time, you see two um, bubble clouds simultaneously. So to, to conclude, uh, we have demonstrated um, the feasibility of a three-dimensional steering of a beam of high, in uh, high intensity, and we reach pressures just slightly below um, what we need for his efficiency treatment work. Uh, these results would be in, uh, improvable further if we could adapt our hardware and uh, the whole uh, geometry of the cavity for a completely 3D um, uh, case. So we are now looking forward to move on to application to therapy. Um, and we, we think we'll target large, uh, large regions or movie gorgons as we can now track um, a target uh, in time, in real time, sorry. And well, I encourage you to go and see uh, Olivier Villeneuve's uh, presentation tomorrow on coronal cutting uh, for cardiac application.